so it's not just an individual's philosophy in that it's like i'm just sitting in a room and imagining the world around me as much as it it's, it's saying like there is like a, a a focus on you know our own individual radical freedom here and the consequences of that are extreme and a lot of people spend a lot of time denying themselves uh, this like idea of, of, of freedom that they do have and instead you know completely you know telling themselves that their lives are only determined by outside factors right yeah uh, and, and I even think like in uh, being in nothingness uh, which is which is the book that's where he's just doing you know comes before the sort of grappling with Marxism he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's just doing pure existentialism uh, one of his uh, one of his examples is a waiter uh, is about a waiter who's uh, who's because of his his job right you know he's he's sort of going through the motions and, and playing this 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 role this this kind of character that's that's imposed on him you know mm -hmm. by, by the fact that he's he's doing this uh, for uh, you know for for work uh, and uh, and he's and which is you know contrasted to uh, to to this idea that you should be acting you know i mean it's, it's kind of funny actually the phrase bad faith is uh is, is has become incredibly popular on the online left and i'm not always crazy about that obsession you know with what counts as good faith and what counts as bad faith mm -hmm. uh but uh but I, I think people are ultimately getting it from uh, from sartre who uh who talks about acting in good faith you know when you're um when you're sort of acknowledging and taking ownership of the fact that you know you are who you you choose to be you know they, they you're, that uh, that your essence comes from these uh these free choices uh that uh, that you're making uh and, mm -hmm. and acting in bad faith is is when you're you're denying that right you know, you're sort of acting as if things are out of your control uh in in a certain way uh and so as you say so you know like the interest in in you know marxism and socialism and communism comes in uh you know, one obvious way that that comes in, I mean, besides obviously the fact that, uh, you know, his country was invaded and occupied by, uh, by the Nazis and, you know, uh, French communists were incredibly important in resisting that. And the, you know, and the sort of larger politics, of the war and all that obviously are a big factor, but like a sort of more purely philosophical reason uh, is, is that, well, I mean, if you have to, for your work, right, to make a living, if you're kind of compelled to uh, to just do whatever your boss says all day, uh, and uh, and and act, you know, and that sort of shapes all of your actions. Then that's kind of uh, that's kind of compelled bad faith. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and yeah, I think this is a kind of perfect uh, jumping off point to sort of looking at you know search for a method as as a text. And there's a lot in in the book. It's actually quite um, short, obviously compared mm -hmm. to uh, his other huge tomes. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's almost like a preface that you almost sh should read. If, if I were like, you know, a philosophy professor, which I'm not, or if I was somebody who had the time and interest to really spend time, you know, with all these questions, you know, you have to read his big, uh, book, you know, on, on critique of dialectical reason, um, which is sort of the, it, that covers a lot of different stuff that's not even touched upon in search for a method, but that's like the full accounting of a, a lot of these different paths that he's coming into in his criticism of Marxism as it was existing in 1960. But anyway, um, you know, I mean, the reason it's an interesting text, the reason that I have sort of come back to it recently um, is that he makes this, um, he makes this argument that Marxism is the dominant philosophy of his time. Um, and what he means by that is not necessarily that it's like the most popular or anything right. like that, but it's the philosophy that um, has its own terms and like understanding of the world in a way that existentialism just doesn't. Um, he, in fact, argues that existentialism isn't a philosophy um, and, and this is more like philosophy nerd stuff for folks who are sort of casual listeners to this. What he means by that existentialism is more of an ideology than a philosophy. And what he means by that is that existentialism doesn't have its own uh, grounding that can allow it to exist as like a totalizing philosophy that can sort of explain and engage with the entire world, right? Existentialism is dealing with a very specific part of our reality. Um, while Marxism is, you know, a grand theory of, of history and economics and, and class, 
Um, so when he says it's the dominant philosophy, he one thinks that it's correct. Um, but two is the dominant philosophy wherein if you actually want to engage with philosophy, you either have to accept or reject it. You have to deal with it. You can't just you know imagine that Marxism, if you really want to do serious philosophy, you have to either reject or uh, you know deal with Marxism as, as a philosophy, unlike you know, you can ignore some other uh, <laughs> you know, smaller questions like, you know, I'm sure Ben would be a better at coming up with examples of that. But you know, he basically argues yeah, that you don't, you, don't, you don't have to have a uh, I don't know. You don't have to have a take on whether uh, numbers uh, objectively exist prior to, uh, to, to human minds uh, yeah. conceiving of them. You know, like that that's that's not something that, you know, that's that's necessary in the same sense to engage with. Yeah, and and so what he argues here though is really interesting because historically uh, most people actually saw existentialism and Marxism not only as incompatible but actually in opposition to one another. Um, that you know uh, that these, these yeah these were just completely different worldviews and there's some like history of philosophy reasons for that. Um, you know going back you know to Hegel basically as you know most of these things do in continental philosophy but uh, not to get bogged down in that um he makes a really interesting argument that for existentialism to actually be realized as like an like an existing practice um for most people to be like just the way that we're living our lives uh you to have a philosophy of freedom you need marxism to create the conditions for that to exist um, and it reminds me, and I don't want to get into Derrida stuff, but it reminds me, Derrida wrote a really bad book called Spectres of Marx. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's too postmodern. I'm sorry. Um, which, which, but, which by, by, by the way, I mean, this is like that, that clip we started with, you know, was, was Natalie Wynn making fun of, uh, Jordan Peterson for equating, uh, for equating Marxism and, uh, postmodernism, uh, and which is, like amazing if you watch peterson's video about this like he claims that the postmodernists were student revolutionaries from 1968 who after information came out about how bad the soviet union was nobody could be like a, a marxist in public life anymore so they made up postmodernism and every single part of that is true like it's, it's false right like like all these guys uh foucault derrida uh those two guys were both like Neither of them were students in 1968. Like they already had faculty positions. They'd already published postmodern mm -hmm. books before 1968. Uh, the information like about like the revelations about Stalin uh, in the Soviet Union uh, had come out 12 years earlier, 1956, with Khrushchev's secret speech. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who was still, you know, Marxist in 1968, like Sartre, who, by the way, had been very critical of the Soviet Union for a long time, uh, wrote mm -hmm. a book about, you know, Khrushchev's invasion of Hungary, um, were, you know, however they felt about that, they'd long since sorted that out. Uh, and as we saw in that that video clip, you know, these these guys uh, hated each other, you know, like Sartre <laughs> and Foucault. Uh, and <laughs> that book, because I've heard, I've heard people bring that up sometimes when they're trying to justify the Jordan Peterson shit. It's like, oh, uh, Derrida wrote a book about Marx. Like, yeah, motherfucker, read the book, see what he says, because like all that he's getting from Marx in that book, like the only like Marxist thing that he's affirming in that in that Specters of Marx book is just sort of like a vague critical spirit or something like that. Like, yeah, sort of it's a critical that. spirit of like all that's existing, right? It's sort of, and he uses, um, you know, he talks about ghosts a lot, and like some people like i like derrida as as a writer sometimes just because he he gets a metaphor and he'll just like stick with it until the end but anyways he does have a line about about marxism um that i always liked is um in a sense it's like he says it's the only suicidal philosophy and what he means by that it's the only philosophy that like seeks to make itself irrelevant yeah. um, <laughs> which i've always found to be a great line and i think um though a little bit more something I could stand a little bit on more on its own two feet is a little line from, uh, from search for a method um, where like uh, Sartre is sort of going through this idea of the philosophy of freedom and, and this relation to Marxism he says, as soon as there will exist for everyone, a margin of real freedom beyond the production of life, Marxism will have lived out its span. A philosophy of freedom will take its place, but we have no means, no intellectual instrument, no concrete experience, which allows us to conceive of this freedom or of this philosophy. And this is like another part of like Sartre's, and I'd be curious what you think about this kind of yeah. historical argument about philosophy, um, where 
he, he basically is making the argument that, you know, philosophy is almost always like a little bit late. Um, you know, like it's, it's always a little bit late in the sense that like when somebody has the time to think about it and to write it down um, and have it disseminated, like the world is mo moving already in a certain direction, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that philosophy can't, you know, exist is not worth uh, engaging with, obviously, but it's that, you know, these arguments that are being had by philosophers and thinkers are happening in a certain place in time and then are being sort of engaged with um, a bit, a bit, you know, a bit later. Um, but Marxism, uh, for, for Sartre, why he thinks it's really unique and is important is because it's a way of thinking and engaging um, with the world um, rather than something that's extremely dogmatic. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>